Hello everyone, I've got an A-level biology video here on the formation of tissue, fluid and lymph. Now this is one subject that I know uh, A-level students that I've had in my teaching career have struggled um, to understand because the relationship between blood, tissue, fluid and lymph is quite a straightforward one. But sometimes when you, when you talk about the lymphatic system or the role of tissue fluid, it can get a little bit confusing, especially when you consider things like hydrostatic and osmotic pressure. So what this video is aiming to do is to clear all of that up and talk about what tissue fluid is, how it's formed and how lymph relates to it. So the first thing to really talk about is, well, we've got this picture on the right side of the screen. Let's, let's look at what we've got here. We can see we've got blood coming down through the arterial into the capillary network. We've got thin, thin vessels here of capillaries. You can see a branched and then this is the region here where we're going to get gas exchange. So we'll have essentially, if we think about oxygen, just quite simply coming from the red blood cells, diffusing from the blood cells to the cells that require it. And then carbon dioxide and other waste gases diffusing from those cells. They'll diffuse through what's called tissue fluid back into the um, blood plasma to be carried to where they're going to be taken care of. And then the blood leaves to the venule and goes back into the venous system. So here we've got the capillary network, but what you'll notice is that within this network, we've got sort of shaded blue regions of tissue fluid and running through that, something called the lymphatic or lymphatic vessel. So we need to consider what this tissue fluid is and how it relates to this lymphatic vessel. So we can see from the left side of the picture that we've got blood coming in at high pressure. Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about blood, but I have done a video specifically about blood, the components of blood, the cellular part, the liquid part. So we're just going to get straight to it. Now, in the capillaries, the blood is under what we call high hydrostatic pressure. So I'm just going to mention that here. So we're talking about high hydrostatic pressure and we have that at this arterial end and that blood is clearly from the arteriole is then passing into capillaries so in the capillaries the blood is under high hydrostatic pressure and what that does is push the fluid through the permeable capillary walls now this fluid contains plasma with dissolved nutrients and oxygen but no cells or plasma proteins. And it's this that's known as the tissue fluid. So we can see here, if I just circle in red, where we've got plasma exuded. Essentially, because of the high hydrostatic pressure, the high pressure that the blood is under within the arteriole, we're getting some fluid being pushed out through the permeable capillary wall. And this fluid is simply plasma. It's got some dissolved nutrients in, like oxygen, but cells aren't in there and plasma proteins aren't in there because the plasma proteins are too large. And that ultimately is what tissue fluid is. It's, sim it's simply this plasma that's been exuded through the capillary walls. That's all tissue fluid in it. It's the job of the tissue fluid is to surround all the cells allowing exchange by diffusion and facilitated diffusion. So we're getting transport, or transporting oxygen and nutrients from the blood, as I've said, to the cells and carrying carbon dioxide and waste products from the cells to the blood. So that's the role of tissue fluid. And tissue fluid is a result of an interplay between two things, not just the hydrostatic pressure, but also this. Osmosis which is essentially the diffusion of water from an area of high concentration or um, high water potential, more specifically, to an area of low water potential or a lower concentration. So what we're going to do is talk through the story from here, essentially. So when this plasma exuded, what then happens? So let's think about this hydrostatic pressure. This is the pressure of the blood from heart contractions and it's forcing fluid out of the capillaries. So we're just going to make a note of that. So this hydrostatic pressure, because I know exam questions like to ask what this actually comes from, this is the pressure of the blood 
from heart contractions. There we go. So we've said fluid moves out through these tiny gaps in the capillary walls. Now some hydrostatic pressure from the tissue fluid actually forces a small amount of fluid back into the capillaries. But there is a net movement out and that's key. So let's just draw a very quick uh, sketch of something here. So let's imagine this is the capillary. capillary. And we're talking about maybe, uh, let's say, the arterial end of the capillary. So what we have is, if I use say, green here to represent hydrostatic pressure out, what you have is hydrostatic pressure from the blood forcing fluid out. So fluid comes out. And let's just put a value to that to help make this make a little bit more sense. Let's say that has a value of 4 and pressure is units in Pascal. So 4 kilopascals. So there's a 4 kilopascal hydrostatic pressure out. But there is some hydrostatic pressure pushing back. Because there's fluid coming out of the capillary, That the, there is a pressure of that fluid trying to push backwards. So you do get some movement in. So we're going to say that there is let's just say 0.5 hydrostatic pressure back. So what we've essentially got is a net, a net hydrostatic pressure, if we just put here, net as in total, we've got a net hydrostatic pressure of 3.5 kilopascals pushing fluid out. Now we need to consider osmosis. That we've mentioned here because there is an osmotic pressure. Now there is a net loss of water from the capillaries because of these hydrostatic forces. Now what that does is give a more negative water potential than the tissue fluid inside that capillary. So I'll just say that again, there's a net loss of water from the capillaries and that gives them a more negative water potential than the tissue fluid because water is coming out. It's as if there's more water in the tissue fluid than there is in the actual capillary itself. So we need to consider this osmotic pressure. And tissue fluid, it should just be said, has less dissolved solutes in it than the blood. So the water tends to move from the tissue fluid into the capillaries by osmosis. So we've got... If we consider osmosis, so we'll just mention this over here. If we consider the, the osmotic pressure, then what we'll have is essentially a movement in, and let's just say that's 1.5 kilopascals. So because of this osmotic pressure we've got movement of water essentially going into the capillaries. So if we think from the beginning because of the high hydrostatic pressure all this plasma has been pushed out. We've also lost water in doing that and technically then we have more water outside than in so some of the water tries to push back in. So you've got this net osmotic pressure of 1.5 kilopascals pushing in. So if we were to look at a net total at this arterial end of the capillary, we need to consider these two things, the hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Now the fluid movement is a net figure calculated by subtracting the water potential effects from the hydrostatic and osmotic pressure. And what you find is that the hydrostatic pressure is much greater at the arterial end of the capillary compared with the venous end, meaning that there's a net fluid movement changing along the capillary. So let's think about the net we've got here. Because that really is, is the next stage. So we've had a, a net of 3.5 kilopascals coming out from the hydrostatic, 1.5, pushing in from the osmotic. So let's think of an, our net total. So if we imagine, if I just draw this 
here. If we say this, this is a very rough sketch here. This is how I've drawn it with my students and, and they've understood it this way. So let, let's see if this works here. So what I'm, I'm, I've got here is, this is the artery. This here is the vein. And we've got the capillary between the two. It's a very schematic picture, but we'll 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 go with it and see it and see. So we had four kilopascals at the arterial end. I'm just gonna leave the units off and just do the numbers for a moment. Four from a hydrostatic pressure from the blood pushing out, but there was 0 0.5. In fact, and I'll stick with the blue just to make this easier. 0 0.5 pushing back in. And we've got a osmotic pressure now of 1.5 pushing back in. So if we consider at the arterial end what's going on, for, we've got a pressure of 4 kilopascals out, a combined pressure of 1.5 plus 0 0.5, so that makes 2 kilopascals pushing in. So there is a net... of two kilopascals pushing out. So if we think, if we consider the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure, again, just to say, so we've got four kilopascals of hydrostatic pressure pushing out, that's the green, the four kilopascals. We've got the 0 0.5 from that tissue fluid pushing back, but we've also got the 1.5 kilo pascals of pressure from the water that we've originally pushed out pushing back into the capillary so we're out fours coming out or pressure of four out pressure of two in that gives a difference of two kilopascals so that's a net force of fluid out of two kilopascals but when we look at the venous end of this capillary what you find is that the hydrostatic pressure is massively reduced so the hydrostatic pressure in the venous end, let's say something like one kilopascal, we still have 0 0.5 kilopascals of pressure, of hydrostatic pressure from the tissue fluid, forcing fluid back into the capillary. We've got our osmotic pressure again of 1.5 kilopascals pushing back. Now if we consider the net pressure we've got one out a total of 1.5 and 0 0.5 that's two in so we've got an almost minus one that comes to kilopascals now it's not often written with the minus but i'm using the minus to suggest there that essentially that's forcing fluid back in so if we think if we link this picture that i've just drawn in the bottom right to the main picture i started with when blood comes through the arteriole, it's under high pressure. We've got a net pressure forcing fluid out. And that's the tissue fluid that comes out. Ultimately, this plasma that's exuded from these, the permeable capillary walls. It bathes all these tissue cells. But then on the, the right side of this picture, where the blood is at lower pressure, towards the venous end of the capillary we've actually got a net movement of fluid back into the capillary. So we've got fluid coming out, and then on the venous end, fluid coming in. Hence why we've got this bit here saying tissue fluid enters the capillary. Now, not all that tissue fluid returns to the capillaries. Some is drained into what's called the lymphatic system and that's to avoid tissue swelling. So now we're just going to talk about where this lymphatic system comes into play. This part here. So not all tissue fluid returns to the capillary because that's quite a lot of tissue fluid. Some of it has to drain elsewhere. So it drains into what's called this lymphatic system. And if I just, hopefully I've done this right, if I just, there we go. Just a little mini image there. I'll put it at the top of the screen. There we go. And hopefully you can see that when you think of networks in the body, you've got the, people think about the arterial network, the venous network, but the, there is a separate network of lymphatic 
vessels. Now I know the screen's a little bit too small to, to identify uh, what these actual vessels are. I mean, you can search for yourself on, on the internet and find the names of these. But the lymphatic system basically consists of a number of vessels similar to capillaries, which start in the tissues and they drain the excess fluid, which we now call lymph. That's what the lymph is. And that's what hopefully uh, students will be able to un understand that the lymph isn't anything brand new or special. It's essentially the tissue fluid in excess that isn't returned to the capillaries. It just passes into this lymphatic system and we just call it lymph. And then it drains into larger vessels which eventually rejoin the blood system in the chest. Now lymph has less oxygen and nutrients than tissue fluid and more carbon dioxide and more fatty material absorbed from the intestines. Now one thing to note is that present in large numbers are lymphocytes, which are white blood cells. And these are producing what are called lymph nodes, which can filter and destroy bacteria and foreign particles. So I've got a little bit about lymph there. I'll do a separate video on the lymphatic system as a system as a whole. But hopefully that there explains a little bit more about the formation of tissue, fluid and lymph. So because of high hydrostatic pressure of the blood from the heart contractions, we exude a plasma with nutrients dissolved into it. That forms a tissue fluid that bathes all the cells. We get a net part, we need a net pressure pushing the fluid out at the arterial end. Some fluid re-enters the capillaries at the venous end, but some of the excess is, joined, is uh, essentially um, forced into what's called the lymphatic system or lymphatic vessels to avoid tissue swelling. That fluid or tissue fluid we then refer to as lymph and it drains into larger vessels which will eventually get that lymph back into the blood system. Okay, hope all of that helps.